This is the Orange and Black Insider Bengals podcast, newest Bengals cornerback, Trey Waynes. Trey, how you doing, bud? I'm good, how are you? Our special guest is Hall of Fame offensive tackle, former Cincinnati Bengal, Anthony Munoz. I think we have the making of a you know, pretty good offensive line, a young in a couple positions. Hello, Bengals fans. I am Matt Minnick, and this is Shock Talk. Former Bengals defensive back and current NFL media member, Solomon Wilcox. I, I remember 2015, wasn't that long ago. I think we had one of the best losses, and how have been lost in the national football league. Yes, Mr. Dahani Jones. Well, how you doing, Mr. Jones? I'm doing all right. Thanks for having me on the show. You see, you see my see my jersey yeah. over there? We were focused on the coaches did a really great job. The coaches had a really good plan, and <clears throat> honestly, our attitude, I feel, is what carried us over. You know Nine years in the league, 31 years old, still going strong. I think the results kind of speak for themselves. Mike, it's been a pleasure and an honor to have you on again. Bengals director of player personnel, Duke Tobin. Yeah, we're going to build the draft board out all the way from top to bottom like we always do. Former Bengals quarterback, Ken Anderson. Do you look at today's game and think I can complete 95% of my passes? I would love to be playing today. I would have had to learn the shotgun. You know, that's something we didn't really do with Bill Walsh. I think I could have handled it. What is up, everybody? Very special episode of the Orange and Black Insider Bengals podcast coming at you live. If you're joining us Wednesday night, happy to have all of you with us on a myriad of platforms. We're streaming live on the Cincy Jungle Twitter handle. We're streaming live on the Orange and Black Insider Twitter handle. We're on Cincy Jungle's Facebook page and, of course, the Orange and Black Insider YouTube channel. Happy to have everyone with us. I am Anthony Cazenza, joined, as always, on the Far, far side by my co-host, John Sheeran. We're going to get to our very special guest in just a second. But, John, it's free agency. It's salary cap. We've got a lot to talk about. How you doing, bud? I'm good. I'm good. I was just walking earlier today. It was like 60 degrees in Cincinnati. It was nice. But it's also like, yeah, climate change is a thing. But also, you know, it's warm. So we can kind of tell that NFL offseason is in full swing. Free agency is right around the corner. And as it is a yearly tradition around here, we bring in the expert when it comes to NFL contracts, NFL salary caps, specifically with the Bengals, our good friend, Andre Prada. Happy to have you back on the show, man. Great to be here. Thanks for having me on again, John. Thanks, Anthony. It's good to see you, man. Andre, I think the conversation really needs to start here because, like, you know, tools like overthecap.com, um, Spotrack, they're great for gas bags like me and Anthony who don't really know <laughs> much about this stuff, but... You, along with other esteemed and accredited accounts on NFL Twitter, you guys have your own books. You guys do your own calculations just for our listeners and whoever is listening to this, just so they can have a conversation about this. What is the current Bengals salary cap situation looking at right now? And when free agency rolls rolls around in about a month after certain cap casualties happen, what will it end up looking like then? Let's get a good baseline starting point. Yeah, so um, you know those both of those uh, websites are, are great resources. I actually prefer of the two. I prefer Over the Cap. Those guys are great. But but Spot Track or Spot Track, however you pronounce it, does a great service as well. Um, but currently, right now, where the Bengals sit, um, and I think you know I, I sent this this information to you guys. Uh, the cap, obviously, we don't know what it's going to be. There's reports right now that it's going to be. We certainly know what the floor is going to be. It can't be lower than 180, which is $5 million above the 175 floor that was established last summer during during the height of the COVID pandemic. But right now, the Bengals have uh, about 100, I, I believe, it, it, we could talk about cash and, and cap. Um, for cap, I believe they're at 140 or 150, 150 million, give or take in cap commitments uh, for the season. So if we just take and assume, uh, you know, Let's go to high end. I've, I've been working under the assumption that the cap is going to somehow creep up to 185. Um, so that's about 35 million there. But that's again, that's the, the 185 is the unadjusted cap. We have to remember that from th- this past season, the Bengals wrote over almost 11 million. It was about 10.792 million. So you add that amount to the to assume 185. You're at about 195 right now in the adjusted cap. So that's the Bengals cap that they have to work with. So you subtract the current cap commitments, about 150 roughly, that puts them about $45 million in cap space. Of course, that's still with all the cuts that are likely to happen. We can debate the merits of those cuts, but um, that cap room that they have from the from the what, what will end up being the adjusted cap amount is only going to increase with those eventual cuts that you guys have all talked about uh, for, for a period of time now. 
Well, let's talk about those a little bit. That's a nice segue because that's where I was going next. I mean, I think some of the obvious targets, there's been some some murmurs uh, now kind of going into audible talk, I guess, of Geno Atkins not being with the Bengals anymore. Maybe Sean Williams, a guy who we all thought maybe would have had a bigger role on the defense in Lou Anarumo, even with Vaughn Bell coming in, you thought they would have mixed in some three safety kind of looks there. That never happened. Maybe he's a cap casualty. Uh, you know, you're getting AJ Green off the books. What, what I mean, what are, I guess with the cap, uh, these cap casualties that I've mentioned, wh- where do you see some of that coming in and what kind of money can they free up? Maybe Bobby Hart in that mix too, if the Bengals want to spring for another tackle. Um, you know, what, what, what kind of dollars are we looking at there if some of those guys are gone or all of them? Yeah. So the big one there, well, let's start with probably the most obvious one is probably Bobby Hart, the embattled right tackle. Of course, when he signed that original three-year deal, we all kind of laughed at it because he was paid almost seven and a half million dollars in cash in year one, when the year prior in 2018, he was making barely over a million dollars. And so, you know, that was quite the substantial increase in pay for him. So he'll likely be gone and that'll free up about $5.9 million in cap. The Bengals will carry about a million dollars in dead money. That's the $1 million of his prorated bonus. Because when he signed that three-year deal, they gave him a $3 million bonus. So you prorate that out over the life of the contract. It's a million-dollar cap hit for uh, for each year. And so when you cut the guy, um, all that bonus money will accelerate onto the cap. So the cap hit will be a dollar or a million dollars in dead money, but they'll end up saving the, his salary. They won't pay a salary. So that's $5.9 million, $5. million. That's how they get the cap savings for him. You mentioned Sean Williams. Sean Williams is actually not under contract for next year, so he won't be a cap cut. He's already off the books. Same with AJ Green. He's not. He's not accounted for already. Um, but you know, certainly, uh, you know, those guys won't be around. Uh, they won't be Bengals in 2021. BJ Finney is another easy cut. The Carlos Dunlap trade. So Dunlap will end up having been trade for a conditional seventh. Uh, you know, which is what happens when you tank your own value. Unfortunately, there's actually a rumor that he may be, that Dunlap may be a, a cap casualty in Seattle. So we'll see where that ends up going. But um, BJ Finney will save about 3.5 million dollars. We'll save exactly 3.5 million dollars. Uh, with no dead money. I mean, when The reason for that is when the Bengals acquired him, the acquiring team in any trade just takes on any guaranteed money, but there was no guaranteed money for him, and they just take on the base salary. And He had a non-guaranteed base salary for this year, so it's effectively a team option. They don't have to decline it. They'll just cut him, uh, and they'll save all of that $3.5 million in cap and cash. The big one really is Geno Atkins, and, and the question with Geno is if they cut him, if they don't ask him to just take a straight pay cut, because he is a Bengals legend. He was on a Hall of Fame trajectory. I still think he probably is on a Hall of Fame trajectory. So it's just kind of sad to see it end this way. But this is the reality of cap management. you got to maximize your cap dollars, especially in a season where the cap has gone down. Um, so he'll likely be cut. The question will, will be, is he going to be a, a pre-June 1 cut or a post-June 1 cut? And they can actually designate somebody as a post-June 1 cut. Uh, even before actually making that cut. And they can they can do that for up to two players. Any team can do that. The, the difference is because Atkins has multiple years left on his contract. He's under contract for this upcoming season and the following season. Mm-hmm. So he has his bonus money prorated out for this year and next year. If you designate a player as a post-June 1 cut, that bonus money uh, gets spread out over this year. His bonus proration for this year counts against this year's cap. And any bonus proration money for the following year or years, but in Geno's case, it's just one additional year, goes on to the following season's cap. The reason that's important is that clears up, an, if they designate him as a post-June 1 cut, that clears up another $2.6 million for the Bengals to use this year. Yes, of course, that $2.6 million gets pushed as dead money in, onto the 2022 cap, but that's a, you know, that's a risk you're willing to take at this point because you assume that the cap is going to increase next year. And $2.6 million in dead money next year is really is pretty palatable, all things considered. And so I'm thinking, even though the Bengals have never done this to my knowledge, they've never designated a post-June 1 cut because in their mind, and I tend to agree with it, they'd rather, they'd rather just take their, their, their hits in one year, right? They'd rather just bite the bullet, take all the cat mo- dead cat money. But if you don't designate them as a post-June 1 cut, you're taking on $5.2 million in dead money. Now you still are realizing close to $10 million in cap savings. It's 9.6, but you know, I'd rather take split that in half. I'd rather take that 5.2 have 2.6 hit this year's cap and have the other 2.6 hit next year's cap. So you just free up that 2.6, that 2.6 can get you 
maybe a couple decent veterans when the market dries up like a week or two before the draft or after the draft, you'll be finding guys on minimum, you know, veteran salary benefit deals, which we can talk about, or even small one year deals, one year, 1.5 million. Um, so you can sign a decent sized player, a, a couple players for that uh, cap space. So I think that's going to be the ultimate question. Will they deviate from their, their standard operating procedures and designate Gino as a post June one cut? They could also potentially maybe just not even restructure, just ask him to take a pay cut um, and, and kind of lower his cap that way. But so those three guys, Bobby Hart, BJ Finney and Geno Atkins, if you add up their cap hits, even accounting for the dead money they'll leave behind, BJ Finney has no dead money, mm -hmm. they'll, they'll end up netting the Bengals almost $20 million in additional cap savings. So it's about 19.6. So if you add that, remember, to the to the 45, now you're at $65 uh, million in cap room. So the Bengals have a lot of flexibility in terms of their current cap space and then some roster maneuvering in terms of cuts that they can utilize to even further increase that. Talking with the guy who clearly said before this program started, I'm so boring that I read the, the CBA for fun. Andre Parada, salary cap expert. While we're still talking about Geno Atkins, we're getting a couple comments about um, the Bengals potentially bringing back Geno for maybe slightly less pay. Can you explain, I guess in layman's terms, why Geno Atkins' contract isn't necessarily ideal for a restructure and why if the, if the Bengals were to bring him back, he would basically have to take a pay cut? Yeah, I mean, actually, his contract would be okay from a restructure. What they would do is just take his salary. I don't have it in front of me what he's, uh, what he's due to earn in cash. But generally how a restructure works is if there's a roster bonus, they would convert the roster bonus into a signing bonus. And, of course, like I mentioned earlier, you can prorate the signing bonus over then the life, the remaining years of the deal. And so you can you kind of spread out the cap hits a little bit and lower the current year's cap hit. Or what is likely more common is you just take the base salary, a player who's earning a lot of money in base salary, you convert that to, to signing bonus, and then you spread out that difference over the years of the cap so you can create some money. Um, so an easy example, just use some easy number. If he's got a $10 million um, base salary this year, you would convert maybe eight of that to a signing bonus and pay him $2 million in base, $8 million in the bonus, but you could spread out that $8 million over two years, over this year and next, and that would be four years spread out in each season. So you take his $4 million uh, signing bonus prolation plus his $2 million lowered base salary. That's a $6 million cap hit down from 10 plus because you have his base plus his already current prorated bonus. So that's a way to, to save money. But ideally, the Bengals won't do it with Gino because a restructure is really for a guy that you want on your team that you still value at his current what he's making, you just need it to create cap room. So my thinking is that the Bengals value Gino, of course, but they likely value him at a much lower cap hit, just based on his injury, recent injury history and his, and his production because of that, that those injuries. So really, I think the Bengals want him around. So to answer your question, John, I don't think they would approach him for a restructure because that does kick, kick cap dollars down the road. I think they would just approach him to say, hey, Gino, would you be interested in taking a pay cut? And honestly, I think he would say, thanks, but I'd like to see what the market bears for me, which may not be great. And he may come back, but I, I think the more, if he is back under, without being released, it would be under a general, just standard pay cut, which frankly, you don't really see that much anymore because a team is just going to cut a guy if they, if they, you know, they won't agree to a pay cut. Before we move into what deals with internal free agents and external free agents could look like and how that it can impact the Bengals cap we got a question in the live Facebook chat and this is uh it was where I was going to go next so sports with strawberry ice is read uh reading my mind here we go from Gino to Geo in the running back spot the Bengals have quite a bit of money invested in the running back spot because of the Joe Mixon contract last year Geo uh came in and played admirably admirably when Mixon went down with the injury and, you know, Gio has been a really valuable guy to this team, does a lot of the dirty work and blocking and all that kind of stuff. But with all the money invested in that position, is that something that you feel based on cap numbers at that position, what the team needs to do? Is that something you think that they may look at, whether it's Gio or I don't know, something else? Yeah. I think they will look at it. It's certainly, and for the reason, for the precise reason you said, Anthony, they are committing a lot of cap dollars and cash, obviously, too, but cap dollars to the running back position. And, you know, we've all had the debates on that. I think the running game is important. My personal philosophy is I think the running game shouldn't be discounted as some people just kind of casually discount it. Obviously, passing wins in the NFL, but 
Um, I, I, but to me, the running game shouldn't be discounted. But to me, running backs are, are the most fungible position, maybe outside of punter. So the question does become how how valuable is it to to commit that much cap uh, space to to the running back position group as a whole? And based on their spending, the Bengals are, are really spending a lot at that position with the Nixon extension, four point one for Gio would be for a lot of teams, they're the high watermark for the, for the running back on a lot of clubs. And that's the backup running back. Now Gio does bring a lot of value, brings a lot of value as a leader, obviously in the locker room, but also his play. Of course, if you remember, Gio is a great, uh, you know, he's a great third down back in terms of his blitz pickup abilities. There's one play that really sticks out to me. It was a long pass in the Colts game in the first quarter it was a third and nine that I think Burrow hit T Higgins on a play on a go route. And Geo came across the formation. I think he was lined up on Burrow's left. And he came all the way. There was a corner, there was a corner blitz on the play. I forget who it was for the Colts, but Geo comes across the formation to pick up and stonewall that blitzer. If he's not there, if that's, you know, Mixon, Mixon's had his issues in, in pass coverage on third down, you know, I, I so that doesn't go unnoticed by Brian Callahan, by you know, Zach Taylor, by the whole the whole coaching staff, the front office. They notice that stuff. The question for me is how valuable is that? Like, is that worth $4 million, 4.1 on the cap, in addition to what Mixon's playing? Of course, Gio has value, and I like him. He's a great receiver. I think he's built a great rapport with Burrow. But if it were me, I would I would seriously consider it because I I, I want Burrow, even though Gio is great in, his, in that specific regard, a blitz pickup, I would rather just pump everything almost to, to dump all my resources into really protecting Burrow and, and really coming up with a – acquiring a lot of offensive linemen to really protect him up front. And so maybe you make a cut for Gio. I, to answer your question, I don't see them doing that precisely for the reasons you mentioned. They, they highly value Gio for his locker room presence, for the, for the skills that he does bring to the field, which are undeniable. They are. But to me, again, it's a value proposition. If it were me and it, it was a question of, do we cut Gio in favor of maybe signing a couple guys that we really think could improve our offensive line? You know, I think you make that decision to, to cut Geo, but I think they can still make a lot of quality signings and still keep Geo on the books for this next year. So if I had to bet, I would I would anticipate he's still probably around. I agree. Giovanni Bernard's incoming cash this year very is very similar to his cap hit. His incoming cash is four point one million uh per spo track. And that kind of leads in to the next question I want to get at because a lot of people talk about and you know, as we're gonna transition into overall free agency plan and what they're expected to spend. A lot of people just talk about the cap and how much cap space teams are going to use when it's really, it's also about how much cash they're initially going to give out in the first year. This is something that you and I kind of talked about uh, leading up to this podcast, whereas the Bengals like to keep a pretty close cap to cash spend ratio from year to year. And people are, are asking if the Bengals are going to be aggressive, aggressive in free agency this year, based on how much cash they're going to spend already without free agency this year should we should we as fans expect the Bengals to go be aggressive again in free agency because of how much cash they typically have to spend in order to meet that minimum cash spending requirement according to the cba yeah so that's a great question so i actually since the cba since the 2011 cba uh there were provisions in there that required uh minimum cash spending so it's a great it's a great uh, question you had about looking, you know, not just the cap, but looking at historically, what have the Bengals actually been spending in cash per season? Um, so I've looked back and, and the, the, the minimum cash spending requirements under the old CBA started, uh, the requirements started in the year 2013. So I've tracked that since that year. Um, but the way that the CBA is, they, they actually require the spending to be over a four year period. And it's the average over those four years, but I've nonetheless tracked it every year since 2013. So we have eight years of data on it. And I've come up with on average over the eight years, the Bengals have spent 3% in cash over the unadjusted cap. That's on average. Now, I don't know how many parallels we can draw from those previous eight years, even though we have hard data on it, simply because of COVID, right? And the net, the, the downward, uh, you know, the downward trajectory, I mean, not trajectory, the downward uh, nature of the cap. The cap's going down this year. So, you know, they may tighten their belts a little bit, uh, even though every NFL club is still very profitable, even in COVID. I mean, these 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 teams are, are washing cash. Um, so there's no really liquidity issues in terms of paying the money. It's just whether or not the teams from a philosophical perspective will continue to spend as, as they traditionally have. So but if you look back at those eight years, again, on average, they've spent about 
it's the ratio is 1.03 cash to cap. So 3% of cash over the unadjusted cap. Let's just assume for you know this, this this discussion that the Bengals are in line with that, right? So let's assume that the unadjusted cap is 185. If you take 3% of that, that's five at 5.55 million dollars. Add that to 185. That means the Bengals would be in line to maybe spend in cash 190.5 million dollars. To put that in perspective, the Bengals are spending currently in cash commitments, not cap commitments, cash commitments uh, for this coming year. Currently, just under 117. 117 million. So if you do that math, assuming they're 3% over their last eight years, right? They've been on average 3% in cash over the unadjusted cap. That means to me, if they're going to spend 190 and they have 117, that's about $73 million in cash that they can that they can spend this year. And that goes to your earlier point, John. That's really going to be consumed in year one signing bonuses or they the way they structure contracts they generally offer a good a decent amount of year one roster bonus too but that's all cash that goes to the player and that's all cash that hits the book this year so you can quickly see how you know that's a lot of money to spend 73 million in cash um but historically if they follow that eight year trend where they're about three percent they spend about three percent in cash over cap that you know you're looking at some decent free agent signings that they want to if they want to pull the trigger on those um, of course, you have to account for the rookie, uh, not not salary cap here, the cash you're paying to rookie. Of course, you know whoever it ends up being at five, assuming they stay there, Jamar Chase, Penny Sewell, they're going to get a sizable bonus, right? And that cash is, you know, you know they may get a $18 million bonus. So that's, you know, at 18 minus 73, you're down to 55 already. Um, but they, they're in position. Historically, they're, they're currently, their cap is currently at 150, but they're currently on the books for spending in cash this year. 117. So if you get up to the historically 190, which is what the percentages would say, that's a lot of money to work with. That's a lot of money to work with. And we saw last year, they were not scared. They deviated a little bit. They went heavy cash over cap for both Trey Waynes and, um, and DJ Reader. They gave them both big bonuses, which is then prorated, smaller base one. And then it gave each, uh, I don't think they gave them a roster bonus, but it was a big signing bonus. So it was, they gave the player a lot of cash and their they cap did, They did was, give Reader a roster here. bonus. They yeah, they did. They were right. Yeah. yeah, I think Trey was just a straight $15 million signing, $5 million base. So they gave him $20 million in cash. Um, and but his cap it was, I think, $10 million. Do you think there's a because every every time this this time of the year rolls around, um, we we are told to temper our expectations in terms of the Bengals going outside in free agency, and there's always the inward focus. Last year was – you guys both talked about Trey Waynes, DJ Reader. We talked about Von Bell. I mean, there was an outside focus uh, last year, so there's a little bit of a changing of the guard there. There was an interesting article on Bengals.com. We're going to talk a little bit more about that a little bit later in the show as well. But to kind of maybe say that that's a little bit more of a trend rather than an anomaly, but – do you see the the Bengals being more inwardly focused with their free agents this year, or do you think they're going to do the the outside forays like they were like they did last year? It's a great question. I mean, we'll see starting March seventeenth. But if I had to guess, I would say they still make some targeted free out external free agent signings. That's really just based on a couple factors. One, what they did a year ago, and two, the fact that they had Joe Burrow on a rookie contract coupled with the fact that they saw his left leg just utterly devastated on the field in Washington. I mean, that's a sign. That's a sight that no Bengals fan wants to see. I mean, imagine being the front office or the coaching staff and your, your, your franchise is lying there, his knees shredded because you thought your own line was fine going into the season and your left guard got overpowered by John Allen and 600 pounds of humanity fell on your franchise's left knee. Left knee. And frankly, I'm no doctor, but that that injury was so brutal. I thought Joe Burrow suffered way more damage than he, you know, I was thinking maybe even compound fracture. I mean, it just was a brutal hit. But to your point, I you mentioned Von Bell. I I was on the Von Bell train last year. I I my projected contract for Von Bell was much higher than what it ended up being. So kudos to the Bengals for getting great value on that. And even though Von Bell is not the best in coverage, he struggled early in the early half of the season. But I think over time, and not just because of his hit on Juju. I think Von Bell showed his value uh, to the Bengals, and he's on a nice three-year deal. That's you know that's a window in the NFL. That's a long contract, and he's under contract two more years. And and you know if I had to guess, I think we, we may see a decent amount of like Von Bell signings, two or three of those like targeted signings, mid-tier, 
but I do think they make a, at least one major signing on the offensive line to answer your question, external free agent. They have nobody in house. They can't roll the dice on just maybe using the fifth pick or the you know, 38th pick in the second round. They, they have, they have the money, they have the cap, they have the need. Uh, and they saw what happens when you don't address it with Burroughs injury. I think, you know, I would be shocked if they don't bring in at least two external offensive linemen, free agents. The caliber of those guys is remains to be seen, right? Are they going to be in the Matt Filers or, you know, Daryl Williams mold or, you know, even maybe a lesser tier than that? Or are they going to be in the Joe Toonies and Brandon Scherf's? Who knows? But they have the ability, their attitude. They have the ability to add a Trent Williams if they want. Although, I, you know, Trent uh, is going to ask for a lot of money. He's up there in age. He's a great player. But um, to answer your question, I don't see them reverting back to their ways prior to last year where it was just – We'll bank on re-signing our own guys, and then we'll kind of pick around at like the third tier, third wave of free agency. I think that's too much of a risk to handle. And then, uh, you know, you mentioned the article. I'm, I'm not sure which one we'll talk about, but the one today about with with Elizabeth Blackburn, which is very mm-hmm. inspiring to read. I I think you'll see a commitment. They know they're they're not dumb, right? They they have the ability, they have the, the, the wherewithal to do it, and I think we will see it. Whether that's Joe Tooney remains to be seen, but I think there's at least one big offensive lineman, you know, external free agent offensive lineman that's brought in. 600 pounds of humanity landed on his knee. That should have been like like the lead like title for every article <laughs> in November. Um, but let, let, let's go ahead and talk about that. Let's go ahead and talk about projected offensive line investment. You, you listed some names. Obviously, Joe Tooney is super popular around these parts. Matt, Matt Filer is gaining some traction. Daryl Williams with the name. Let's just, let's just go under the assumption that they signed like a guy – like Tooney and pair him with like a Filer or Williams. I, I know um, a lot of our listeners have subscriptions to The Athletic. They played this Choose Your Offseason Adventure that was written by Paul Daner Jr. And in that type of offseason simulator, they found out that, you know, Joe Tooney's um, cap hit for 2021 was like $14 million, which is like his projected average annual value. And like they found out they, they couldn't really afford these two guys, but it's not necessarily like that. So like, can you explain why if the Bengals sign a guy like Tooney and pair him with Williams, why their total combined cap hits wouldn't be over like 20 or 30 million. Why it'd be a little bit less than that. Yeah. And it's a great question. And this is the critical distinction to understand, which you guys understand it of the difference in cap and cash. Right. And so we, you mentioned earlier, we were talking about the cap, the cash to cap ratio. So the way to get that, you know, a lot of people think they see a contract that's reporting the media Use simple math, right? Like five years, 50 million. They'll say it's a $10 million average. It's a nice $10 million cap hit per year. It can be that way. You can certainly structure contracts that way, but the vast majority of contracts, especially that large in the NFL, are not structured that way. They're structured in a way where a big, decent signing bonus is given to the player. And like I mentioned with Gino with his dead money, that signing bonus is spread out over the life of the contract for a maximum of five years. And so you can pay a guy a lot in cash via a signing bonus. That's cash in his pocket. He gets that. Now, he may have different payment terms. He may get half now and half later in the year, but he'll get that this year. But because you can prorate that salary, that, that signing bonus over the life of the contract, his cap hit's going to be lower. You just give him a, a, a smaller year one base, but at that point, the player doesn't care because he's got his bonus money. And that's the guaranteed part of the, the contract, too. And that's the only part of the contract that the Bengals can guarantee. Same with the Steelers, same with the Packers. We can talk about the way they structure and, and guarantee their, the guaranteed portion of their deals. But um, it, it's just – it's it's a little unsettling sometimes. Not unsettling. It's, it's, it's at, NFL contracts. But I, I do I, – I, I don't like when, when people just assume they look at the yearly average and they say that's going to be the cap hit or that's going to be the year one cap hit. It's very rarely that case. Now – Bear in mind, when you do go heavy cash over cap in year one and that first year cap hit is lower, you are going to have to make that up because the cap hits are all going to end up equaling the the overall dollar amount of the contract. Every dollar paid to the player is ultimately going to have to end up hitting the team's cap. The question is, when does it hit? So, right. So if you, if you give them a bonus, that proration means that those cap hits can be, can hit a future year cap. So um, it's a way to structure contracts. I think you you expose yourself to risk because you're leaving yourself open to dead money whenever you have any proration. But in a year like this year where the cap is lower due to COVID and the cap, based on what I've been reading about the TV deals coming, coming up, the new TV deals and the bang or the, the NFL apparently asking for a hundred percent increase in all the, from all the TV uh, pr- providers, 
the cap is just is going to go up, right? We're not going to have another COVID situation again. Hopefully not for another hundred years, but certainly fingers, not fingers crossed. In this CBA, we hope not. Um, <laughs> right, right. So the cap's going to go up in 2022. So if you can, right, if you can, you want to lower that cap hit this year, keep it as low as possible, knowing, of course, the next year and the future years are going to, you're going to have to pay more. You're, the cap hits are actually going to be more than the average in that year. So, but to your point, it was, it was a nice little exercise that they did at the athletic, but it was a little unrealistic in the sense that yes, the overall point is yes, it's challenging fitting all these players within the cap. But the point is there are ways to structure it so that the year one cap hit it's much lower or even lower uh, than what the average annual uh, value of the contract is, the, the contract APY. So it gives teams flexibility. I think we'll see a lot of it this year, again, because you're just pushing cap down the road. It exposes you to dead money. It's not without risk, but it's a smart risk to take because you need you need to, you need to maximize your cap space this year. You, you just need to do it, and especially with a borough on a rookie contract. You, you ideally want to maximize your cap dollars in, in year one on, in a down cap year. Uh, I know you've got a, a document. I, I hope I didn't miss the proper time to share some of this info. Did I, did I miss that already? Can I pop it in here? Is that cool? No, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just, I didn't know if I uh, missed the time here, but um, do you want to kind of describe a little bit of, of what we're, what we're looking at here? And um, I, I don't want to, I know you're going to share a lot of this stuff on your Twitter account. So first of all, tell everybody where to follow you on Twitter, but um, what, what are we looking at here and, and, uh, you know, kind of let our, let our listeners know who are watching the video portion as to what you've put together here. Yeah. So yeah, this is, this is perfect. So this is just kind of my off season plan really for the Bengals. This, this lists the cap hit and cash spends for each player that's currently under contract. And of course the players that I propose to sign as contract. So if you want to go down, you'll see in the O-line group, uh, Joe Tooney there highlighted in green. And you'll see those two columns are the, 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 the two columns on the right are for the 2022 year. Cause I always like looking ahead because teams always look ahead. teams actually look ahead for as long as players are under contract. So they'll have the cap hits for 2023, although the Bengals really don't have that many beyond 2022. Um, but take a look at Joe Tooney, right? Second from the bottom of the online grouping. If you look at his left hand column, that's his cap hit for year one under my proposed contract. I'll tweet out those proposed contracts that I have for, for Tooney. And I think it's a market rate deal. I think it's going to be pretty similar to what he'll get on the market. The, the Patriots aren't going to tag him again because they tagged him last year. And if they tagged him this year, again, it'd be 120% increase of last year's tag. And even though the Patriots have a lot of money and, and cap space, they just, they won't do that. They, they just won't tag him. Um, so he'll be on the market. Joe Tooney will be on the market. He'll be available. But if you look at his, his cap hit, I, I proposed his contract. I'll tweet it out. You can find me at Andre Parada 13. Um, I've, I've proposed a contract in a way that gives him a year one cap hit of 8.75 million. So if, to John's point earlier, if you remember that athletic exercise, they were keeping his cap hit at the air, average annual value, which was 14. So that's, that's 5 million and change right there that you've saved on the same player that you have five more million dollars to work with. But if you look at the right-hand column, look how much they're paying Joe Tooney under my proposal in cash. They're paying him $20 million. That may seem like a lot, that is a lot, and you say, is that worth paying to a guard? And I just say, go to that Washington game. Go look, look what happens when you have questionable guard play. And Joe Tooney, I mean, not that anybody needs convincing. And you can argue, is, is Joe Tooney at $20 million in cash that much better than like than like a Matt Filer at $8 million in cash? Probably not, right? I mean, that's a good value signing. But again, I don't want to roll the dice anymore. I want known quality. And Joe Tooney, for the last for his four years in league, I think it's five years in league because he was tagged last year, has been a known quality. Look at that Super Bowl win in twenty eight in the twenty eighteen season against uh, the LA Rams. He dominated Aaron Donald in that game. Go back and watch that game. I think pre pro football focus gave him a really high score in that game in pass blocking. He was one on one a lot of the time with Aaron Donald, and he really had a great game that, that game. So we'll watch that game if you want to. But again, I, the point of me bringing that up is. And I'm glad you brought up the sheet now, Anthony. So that $20 million cash spend is quite large, but you're going to have to structure the contract in a way that entices Tooney to sign. Because again, the Bengals aren't going to guarantee his base salary. So they're going to have to give him a large signing bonus. And so that the way I get at that $20 million, I've actually proposed to give him a $15 million signing bonus and then just a $5 million base salary. 
So that means he's got $20 million in his cash, but then you, you prorate that 15 over that four years plus the five, that's how you get the 8.75 million cap hit. So that's the difference between cash and cap. This is when, when I reference cash over cap. For the Bengals here, they've gone way cash over cap for year one in Joe Tooney. Um, and so that just means his, his later season cap hits, 2022, 2023, 2024, are going to be over that amount, well over the 8.75 million. And they're actually going to be over his average because if you think about it, they all, they're eventually all going to, to, to get up there. Um, so it's going to be over the average amount, but that's again, the risk you're willing to take because ostensibly the, the cap is going to rise next year in 2022, the cap will be up and the bank. Yeah. You can go over to the 2022 cap, right? So his cap hit next year jumps by almost 10 million. It's 18.25 and you're only paying him only, you know, 14.5 million in cash. And so that's the critical distinction, right? You construct these contracts can, at least the big ones, right. Can be structured in a way where you give the player a big signing bonus that gets the player the, the cash security but it allows the Bengals to prorate that bonus and to lower their year one cap hit to really fit as many players as they like under contract for this year, because they, they have a lot of holes as you guys know. They do have a lot of holes, but I think you laid out a great plan of attack of how to fill as many holes as possible while still ma maintaining their specific financial type of principles and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Like the, the Bengals have cap space and they have cash space to use to, in order to keep that certain ratio. Like they're not going to be able to fill every single hole, but there are ways about how to attack the offensive line, how to fill the rest of the roster with complementary pieces and still maintain, I, I guess the same precedent for what they did last year, because last year was an anomaly in a lot of ways. But like you said, this is a new era, the new coaching staff, and you have a, a quarterback who's making pennies on the dollar based on what his value is. So I think this is a great uh, plan of attack on how to how they, they could address this. And, I, you know, I, I, I can't wait for you to share those contracts with everyone else to, so everyone else can kind of educate themselves on what these deals will actually look like. Because I think I think, like you said, you, you they will end up dishing out deals that look very similar to what Von Bills was last year. Maybe maybe a Tooney contract looks like what DJ Reader's contract looks like last year. They can do things very similar to last year without getting themselves in the, into trouble with the cap this year. Exactly right. And, and one last thing um, uh, about Tooney with, with this contract structure, um, I think we were tweeting about it, I think it was last week or whenever it was, about what are the, you know, without the, a lot of people are worried about that since the fact that the Bengals don't guarantee money, right? They, and they don't, they don't guarantee base salary. The, the only thing they truly guarantee is the signing bonus, just like the Steelers, just like the Green Bay Packers. They very rarely, they never guarantee base salary. So a lot of people think, and you Rose this, made this point nicely on Twitter. It, it, you said, you know, I have to look, well, are the Bengals willing to guarantee 35 million? And, and the way they structure contracts allows them a, a nice workaround uh, from their guarantee for their lack of guarantee policy. And the way they do that is think about this proposal here and I'll, I'll tweet out the, the specifics of the proposal, but remember I, I'm proposing to give Tooney a $15 million contract. Now though they won't guarantee his 2021 salary, but it's practically and effectively guaranteed. They're not going to pay him $15 million in March to cut in in September. They're not going to do that. Right. And so that effectively guarantees his $5 million base. So now you're up to 20 million in guarantee, which is his year one cash. And then the way I've structured it, I've given him a year two roster bonus in March of next year. And that's a pretty sizable bonus, which means even if Tooney bombs next year, like look at Trey Waynes, right? Trey Waynes has a year two roster bonus. He was injured. He's on the roster next this year, right? So the way they structure contracts allows them to have a nice little workaround from their lack of, of, of truly guaranteeing base salaries like a lot of other teams do. So when people get hung up on, well, they have to offer this amount of guarantees. The Bengals do a nice job of structuring their contracts because they're not going to cut a guy five months from now. They're likely not. I mean, just play out a worst case scenario. Say they sign Tooney to this exact contract and he totally bombs or gets hurt. They're likely they're not going to cut him next year. They're just not. Right. So they're going to pay out the offseason roster bonus. And since they're going to do that, then they're going to pay him again next year. So his first two year salaries are effectively guaranteed. And you mentioned the Zach, the, the benchmark metric that they should try to, to eclipse in order to induce Tooney to sign. And I mentioned, if you offer him a deal that make, gives him the, the highest two-year cash flow of any NFL guard in history, I think that's a good inducement to get him to sign on the dotted line because 
the way the Bengals structure contracts and the way they historically operate, he's going to see every dollar, at least in those first two years. So if you give him more cash than Zach Martin earned, and even, you know, not just match it, but give him a little more, I think, you know, you can start, you can start at a nice point with Joe Tooney. I think you, you can work your way towards signing him. So I think it's very realistic to think that they have an opportunity to sign him. I think it's very realistic, but whether they do it is, is ultimately up to them. So, but I, I, you get the point that I'm making, right? About the guarantee money and how they, affect, right. how their structure allows yep. them to effectively guarantee it. Yep. And uh, to your point, Andre, you know, the, the Bengals, at least historically, you know, they, they do have their players see uh, much of, if not all of the life of their contracts. Uh, you, that's usually how, how it works. The Drake Kirkpatrick release, um, that was kind of a, a detour off of what they normally do and not having him see the end of that contract. So um, good, good stuff on this chart. And what I like about it is not only does it break down everything to a T, but it also shows a realistic plan. That being said though, um, and I don't want I, I don't want you to give away the entire farm, I guess, of what you're going to put out on your social media. But if you had some predictions as to what the Bengals will do, whether it's with Carl Lawson, William Jackson using the franchise tag potentially on one of those two, um, a Joe Tooney, a Daryl Williams, one of these. What do you what do you kind of foresee the team doing, realistically speaking? Um, yeah, they've got a lot of flexibility this year, but you know, uh, they, they may surprise us either positively or negatively in some respects. So if you kind of had your own personal, I know you've got your projections and what they should do, which is a great plan, but if you kind of had some predictions or whatnot, what do you, what are you thinking? That's, that's a great question. I, I think they will prioritize their, their biggest internal free agents, which of course are William Jackson, the third and, and, and Carl Lawson. The question about the tag, I've gone back and forth with. Originally, I was like, there's no way they'll let a top-tier corner hit the market in this prime. I know Jackson's a little advanced in age um, compared to when he came out in 2016. He was an older rookie. Mm -hmm. So I always thought, you know, maybe that tag is the, is the good deal. And, you know, because they, they, they want to at least secure his services for next year. So you can do that via the tag. But I've admittedly gone back and forth on the tag. And I I... I know you asked me what the what I think the Bengals will do, but I, I don't want them to use the tag just from a strict cap management perspective. And the reason is pretty simple in my eyes. Once you once you tender the player his franchise tag, as soon as he signs it, that money hits the the cat hits your books for the tag amount, which technically aren't even known to the to the dollar yet. But you know the DN tag amount is going to be more than the corner cornerback uh, tag amount, but they're both north of fourteen million, almost fifteen million, I think, for the cornerback market. To the point, you know, when we just were highlighting the, the Joe Tooney contract, I'd like to keep the year one cap hits lower, give the guy a little bit more cash. But with the with the franchise tag, you can't do that. It's literally stuck in the mud, if you will. It's a it's a placeholder that hits your cap immediately. So it's immediately fifteen million dollars. Let's just call it fifteen. Whether it's Carl Lawson or William Jackson the third, just for easy reference, let's just say it's fifteen million dollars, right? That's fifteen million dollars that's on your books, and you can't move it. You can't do anything with it. You can't lower it. The only way you can lower it is if you agree to a deal with the guy, right? And you have until July 15th to do that. And if you don't at that point, he can only play out the, the year on the tag. But the likelihood, if you tag the guy, you know, when those extensions, if they do end up being reached, they aren't until the summer, right? And you're freeing up cap space in the summer when you need the cap space in March to attack free agency, right? So I'm against using the tag solely because once it's tendered, that cap hit is stuck. You cannot maneuver that. You are stuck in the mud with that cap hit of $15 million. And I want as much flexibility as possible. So in order to do that, I forego tagging anyone. As, as tough as that is, knowing that you got players in their prime at premium positions on an, RL, or on, on an already really poor defense, to be quite honest, it's tough to say that you run the risk of losing those guys, but the way I think the Bengals will pr propose it, and they, they could very well tag one of these guys. I think if I had to pick, they, they likely will tag Carl Lawson and then run, uh, extend him or at least try to extend him. But again, I, you're st that, that, that cap number is stuck in the mud. When, once you tag a guy, you can't do anything with that number. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's tough, but what I think I, what I would do is I would say, Hey, Carl, Hey, Will, William, here's our best offer, right? The tag, you could actually start tagging people since this Tuesday, you have until March 9th, eight days before the new league year begins. So that's March 9th. That's the deadline. I would say, Hey, look, as we get to March 9th, here's our last best offer. We really want you back. Here's our best deal to you. Now, if you go out on the open market, 
Obviously, the tag gives you the right to match, right? Whether it's exclusive or not exclusive, even the transition. But the transition tag, I really don't think is, I think you guys mentioned it earlier. The transition tag, a lot of teams don't use it because you're effectively setting yourself up. Somebody gives you a, a, a deal that you don't want to match and really it, you don't get any draft point, uh, draft pick compensation anyway in return. So I don't think, I think the transition tag's out of the window, even though the cap hit for that is, li is a little lower. But I think they say, go out on the market. We, we've, we've given you our last best offer. Go out on the market and at least give us the courtesy of, of, of telling us what your best offer is, right? The player doesn't have to do that, of course. The player can just say, this is my best offer. I'm gone. Um, but I think they could. They come, you know, they you go back on the open market. You say, come back to us with your best market and maybe or best offer and maybe we'll match it. And that way you avoid having to have that stick in the mud of a one year immovable cap hit unless you extend the guy. But the reality is you're likely not going to extend it. The last guy, a couple, you know, AJ Green was tagged. And granted, he was hurt. And so that derailed his contract extension. But remember back in the early part of the last decade, Michael Johnson, defensive end, he was tagged and he left. You, and then he came back after a year in Tampa or a year or two. I forget how many he spent in Tampa. But the reality is if you tag a guy, that means you guys are – the, the player and the, and the club are way off uh, in terms of how they value how they see their value. And the likelihood is that the guy's going to leave. It's, you're going to have a player on a one-year deal, and the guy's just going to leave the next year. Um, and so, you know, I'd rather run the risk of not tagging anybody and, and saying, hey, come back to us. The best deal you do get on the open market if you want to come back to us and let us – the opportunity to match it. And then if you don't want to match it, you just kind of go your separate ways at that point. And maybe you look for some, some replacement players on the market at a, at a better cap hit. But um, I know that's a long winded answer, but I personally, I don't want the cap because it, it doesn't allow much cap flexibility at all. It's, it's a stick in the mud in the cap. It's immovable. Um, but I, I, I honestly think they value Carl Lawson at least a little bit. And if you've read some reports recently, it said, it seems like um, they are leaning towards, placing the non-exclusive franchise tag on him just to secure his services for next year. I think Carl Lawson tweeted out some ominous sounding things like uh, about value or something, not om ominous, but you know, something that, you know, you can read the, between the lines of an yeah, offer, that yeah, was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. offer that was made that he probably thought was a little light, but that's the way that it goes. Right. Um, you know, it's actually pretty deep in terms of uh, some edge rushers. I mean, Baltimore has a whole host of edge rushers that are going to be on the market. Matt Judon, McPhee, a couple guys, uh, Unique and Glockway, who they traded for. Um, so I want Lawson back, of course. I just wouldn't use the tag, but I think they will. I think they will use the tag on him. And to go back to your other point, I know it's a long answer, but the Bengals, uh, you know, they do tend to live out or, you know, f fulfill their, their contract uh, years to their players. But you mentioned Drake Kirkpatrick, and I'm glad you did. Um, recently, though, the Bengals are, 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 are cutting guys, which is actually good. It shows you that they're not married to these people in terms of we just want to maximize cap space, right? And so if the value is not there, we're not going to think twice about cutting you. Andy Dalton, obviously we had uh, his, his replacement in line, but Ray Maluga, Georgia Loca. Remember, Georgia Loca was a surprise cap cut. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he signed a pretty decent extension, and they cut him a year or two after that. Uh, back in the early part of the decade, Tra Travell Wharton, offensive lineman, Jason Allen, a corner, Preston Brown, Bobby Hart this year too. You know, under the old ways, Bobby Hart would just be around next year, right? But they know that, you know, they there's no value in keeping him around for a $6.9 million cap hit. So slowly but surely, yes, you know, the Bengals tend to, 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 to honor the length of their contract. But slowly but surely, they're, they're getting out of bad deals when they can, you know? And that's good for them. I'm glad they're doing that. There is definitely money to be spent, and I think that's why we can all assume that in some way, shape, or form, a guy like Carl Lawson will return to the Cincinnati Bengals in 2022. Andre, you gave us 50 minutes of your time, and we are extremely grateful for it. This is a great tradition that we have every single year before free agency in the, in the new league year begins. R real quick, just so everyone can know, where can they find you on Twitter so they can see these contract projections? Yes, it's uh, just my name, Andre Parada13, the number 13. So... Uh, you guys are great followers on Twitter and love, love the work you guys do here. Uh, so yeah, always enjoy uh, chatting with you guys. Yeah. Thanks, man. And hopefully we can maybe get you back on after some of these signings occur. So maybe we can see the impacts and all of that. We'd love to go over that with you too. Once, you know, contract details and stuff kind of come out, that'd be interesting. Love to do it. Awesome. Well, thanks for the time, Andre. Appreciate it, man. Take it, take care. And you, everybody guys. listening, go follow this guy, especially this time of year. I mean, he's a great Bengals follow in general, but especially this time of year, go follow this guy. Awesome guy. Thanks for your time, Andre. Good, good seeing you again, man.
You guys are the best. Thanks, guys. John, thanks for uh, setting up Andre coming on the show, man. That was uh, that was a lot of fun. Very informative as always. And I mean, gosh, the generosity of the guy, you know, hoping for 20 minutes or so and the guy gives us 50. It's it's incredible. I love that. Um, and I always feel I always get an ego boost because I feel like I'm a lot smarter than I actually am after after hearing him talk. <laughs> but good stuff. I appreciate you, you know, reaching out and getting him back on. I mean, that's literally what it was like. We, like we we started the conversation like last week, and and I realized like, yeah, I don't really know a lot about this stuff, so I better I better learn this stuff pretty quickly before I start talking to him. But like, that's that's just who he is. He's a he is a vast just <laughs> he, he's got he's he's got a, he's got a lot of information, a lot of useful information, and he shares it very generous, like you said. And it's always great to have him on. I know. I I, I feel kind of bad. I was like, hey, uh, you have any? thing you want to like share for this for, on screen so we can share with our listeners. And I feel like I was taken away a little bit of his <laughs> social media stuff, but um, being the great guy that he is um, it was, he was, he was generous enough to share that spreadsheet that he put out there. So go follow him. Awesome stuff. We're not quite done yet. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more. We're kind of blending segments and topics that we usually do. We had like free agency spotlight. We had, you know, we, we usually do that, but since we talked about so many free agents, we were going to, uh, kind of blend that in with the the, the chat with Andre there, um, and we're going to talk about we're gonna, we usually go over a little bit of news and then also talk. Uh, we do a state your case segment. We're going to kind of blend that before we do. Just want to remind everybody: get the show how you can iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, Megaphone, iHeartRadio, all of the major audio platforms. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's a little icon down there by John. You can click that and subscribe to our YouTube channel get notified uh, and like the Cincy Jungle Facebook page too. So you get notified when we're going live, when Ace and Zim are going live on Orange is, Orange is the New Black, as well as new episodes of Chalk Talk by Matt Minnick. So um, definitely subscribe. And for those of you, I said it Monday, for those of you who listen on Stitcher, make sure there, for some reason, Stitcher did two different feeds of our audio podcast. So make sure that you are following the one that's the Cincy Jungle one. The Orange and Black Insider one has stopped um that's just orange and black insider has stopped updating, but the one that is Cincy jungle should be updated with all kinds of episodes. So make sure if you, if you get your pod, our podcast there, uh, make sure you, you, you get the stream there, John, I, I'm going to let you kind of intro this and then I'll, I'll go into the state your case. But as we talked about with Andre a little bit, there was a very interesting article on bangles.com on Wednesday um, by one of the Blackburns. And it was something that was really inspiring and kind of a, an uplifting piece to Bengals fans. So I'm going to let you talk about it a little bit and I'm going to go into my state your case from there. Yeah. So if you guys don't know who Elizabeth Blackburn is by now, you should probably educate yourselves a little bit. Elizabeth Blackburn is the granddaughter of Mike Brown. She is the eldest daughter of Troy and Katie Blackburn. So she is the great granddaughter of Paul Brown. And you can kind of see where, the, where the genes kind of, kind of flow into her a little bit. She wrote an editorial piece on bangles.com. And it's something that I don't think I've ever seen before. And I, I don't think people older than me have ever really seen this before. If you, if you were to ask, if you were to ask someone what the Bengals vision statement was like the Bengals have a vision statement. We don't even know what they do. We don't even know what their priorities are. Like, <laughs> Elizabeth Blackburn wrote the Bengals vision statement on Bengals.com. And that was the first real thing that really kind of shocked me because a lot of times, because Mike Brown kind of hides behind, you know, maybe one or two media appearances a year. There's not a ton of accountability on his part. You know, he's just kind of here to, to do a job and do it to the best visibility. But we don't really see accountability in print form from anybody representing the Bengals now, but this was a four part type of vision statement future plan of action written by the youngest of the Blackburn family in terms of just being executives in, in the franchise. And it was like, this is what we're going to do. We're going to have tangible actions behind it. And our one goal is to win Super Bowls. And you can tell that there's that Elizabeth just oozes passion for this. And she has the experience. It isn't just a lot of people just think it's tongue in cheek to, cl to claim it as like a nepotism hire. She was hired last year as the director of content and strategy or strategy and engagement with the Bengals in the community. But like, this is a very qualified person that 
that knows what that knows what she's doing and you've already seen the progress with this with the Bengals increase in social media presence her partnership with means cameron and uh the um stripes don't come easy movement that they started last year and this is kind of really kind of woven into what their plan is for 2021 going forward w- along with the new uniforms there's they're teasing stuff about honoring past players in the form of what it'll in all likelihood will, will be a ring of honor and j- just to have that yeah we like our one goal is to win championships and our one goal is to be, to be the exemplify exemplify excellence in this sport. And like, that's always kind of been like the, the words, the meaningless words behind what Mike Brown used to say to the media. But like, you can kind of tell that things do sound a little bit differently and there is an overarching change of direction going forward. And I think that's kind of what you wanted to touch on Anthony. It is. And I see, you know, a comment from Ralph Green in the Facebook chat, same old BS. They always say, I'll believe it when I see it. Yes and no, Ralph, because number one, and this isn't my state your case quite yet, but number one, the verbiage that John mentioned about championship football, winning, Super Bowls, plural, those types of words were not really always uttered by Elizabeth's grandfather, Mike Brown. There was competitive there was division winning talks. There was things of that nature. Super Bowls, championships, all this talk that's in this article. Yeah, it's talk. And and talk can be cheap and hollow at times. But this is just a different vibe than other, I guess, press conferences, news, uh, you know, media appearances by the Brown family members, especially Mike Brown. It just had a lot more energy. It had a lot more focus and purpose behind the words that were written here. Um, And to your point, John, I I think, you know, you've seen the initiative on their social media side. They've made great strides there. Um, And there's a lot of different things that were pointed out here as to what what they're trying to do. And I guess my state your case here is Elizabeth is new on, at least to my knowledge, is new to the Cincinnati Bengals and what she is doing with with the team. But this isn't just a, like you said, a courtesy nepotism hire. This is far more than that. And this is somebody that they feel is in that millennial wheelhouse, that age bracket that can engage fans on a different level than they've been able to do. And, I, you know, I think that this is, she has a much more prominent role than just writing this statement and what she is charged to do is a very important role with not only the within the organization to make them a winner, but to engage the fan base and to create a culture, a culture of winning. But she even mentions, John, the stuff in the stands at the game, right? We don't exactly know exactly what in crowds and in-game experience will look like this year based on what happened last year and everything going on with the COVID crisis. But we tend to think there's going to be more people, even if it's a slow increase, that sort of thing. And she talks about in-game experience. And that probably ranges from honoring Bengals players. That probably ranges from, you know, that she mentions the chants and the songs and dancing and all this kind of stuff in this article. And these are the things where you go, yeah, yes. As, as a Bengals fan, <laughs> Well, I mean, seriously, you're kind of like, you're like, where nobody, nobody in the organization really has talked about this kind of thing and making it the entertainment side of things, the fan engagement side of things. And now you've got someone who is purposefully not only trying to improve the football team and using data strategies and all this kind of thing, but also utilizing the other arm of things, social media engagement, in stadium engagement. And I, I think that we're going to see in here, from her a lot more in the days ahead. And I think that's a very good thing, despite what we all may think about the Brown family and the Blackburns. I I was very impressed by this article today. There are fans out there, undoubtedly, who are much older than me, who are much more jaded and will claim that, yeah, I've I've heard and seen this before. I don't really care about this anymore. I just care about wins. Of course, I don't think like that has never not been what the priority should have been for this team. But again, like, to see it actually with and like read it. And so it's there and it's like, it's, it's proof. It's evidence. It's, it's accountability in the form of something that you can actually prove. Cause like you said, like the, like the standards under Mike Brown, when he was, when it was more of an autocratic type of ownership, like the standards seemed to be a little bit lower. And it was just about getting the, the standard 
you know, league share of revenue and just keeping your heads above water and just trying to win the old way. Like it, like that doesn't seem to be the case anymore. You know what I mean? It, it's like, it, and again, like, like, are these words going to do anything? No, obviously. And that's where you, you're getting some of the jaded responses from it. But to just, I, I, to just see it, I just think that's like, that's any sense of progress is good progress in a sense. It, because like, because when, when we like, go on and on about like why aren't aren't, why don't they have a ring of honor why don't they have an indoor practice facility why don't they have the same standards of just operating facilities and just the same standards of any other franchise like why don't they have this stuff like that that's why they that's why guys like us we keep harping on it because in order to really get to the next level of success you you gotta feel like you have to have the same baseline as everybody else that's why i think those things kept getting brought up because the Bengals didn't even have those types of things. Like for a long time, they didn't have the same standards in terms of the locker room, in terms of weight room, in terms of player and um, amenities, the, the whole Gatorade situation. They were so far below what the standard for an NFL franchise was that it seems stupid and fruitless to talk about winning Super Bowls. The fact that they're not only, not only, not only approaching, but at the same level now as the same standards of just quality of a, being a franchise as the rest of the league. Now I think that the talk of actually competing for Super Bowls and competing for relevancy, it's it's more relevant now and it's because of statements and actions like we're seeing from Elizabeth here. The statement that really grabbed me is the one I highlighted on the, the screen I'm sharing here. Um, the Bengal, Bengals strive to be a championship football team with a culture built on high standards and competitive hunger. We connect players, fans, th- this last sentence here, we connect players, fans, and partners into one team to create an enduring legacy in Cincinnati. Now, for so long, John, it felt like this team has kept its fans at an arm's, arm's length, There were players that said, you know, Mike Brown would endear himself to certain players that he favored, you know, a lot of these reclamation projects. And he kept going back to some of these guys and just, you know, tried to give them another chance, another chance. But there were other players that he brought in that there kind of was uh, a lot of players talked about almost an ivory tower type of type of situation where it was just like, yeah, we don't really communicate that much with management, with ownership. It's gotten better from what we understand in, in more recent years and in the Marvin Lewis era that that ice melted a little bit. But, you know, I think this situation where it's talking about kind of this unity and now you have a person a little bit younger on the age spectrum that gets it and wants to be that conduit between players and the team and between the fans and players and fans and ownership. I, I just think this is this is a really promising step forward, even if it's just words on a page or a website. I, I just I feel a little bit energized based on what I read on this, and, and I'm I'm really excited to see what this young lady's career is gonna gonna blossom into with this team. And again, like obviously it is the words, but there already has been action. Like it's not like she hasn't mm-hmm. done she's done nothing. Like like the Bengals never used to be this active on social media. They, they never had the same level of relation w- w- with players in terms of giving them amenities. Like I remember talking to Emily Parker a couple of, like I think in 2019 in terms of like players um, uh, w- working with like the, the, the videographers about like uh, player intros and like the stuff that you see on the big board and like players like we never really used to do this. This, this stuff is really normal. And like that, that started even before uh, Elizabeth came into the building. Now, ever since then, you're seeing more engagement with the community. And like you said, that, that connection between the the team and the fan base to make sure that like like they, they are still a part of this like that is something that you see from successful organizations around the league now does it directly correlate to winning no but for people that love to talk on and on about what what a culture does and what it means like if you believe that your team is at the the, the pinnacle standard of excellence around the league in terms of how they operate then it kind of gets instilled in you that like yeah we can do anything that any other team can do. And that used to not be what it was with the Bengals. It was just winning by luck and winning by this outdated um, system of, of roster construction and roster construction is doing the bare minimum just, just to get by. That doesn't seem to be the case anymore. And you kind of, you kind of see it and feel it with these words and with these tangible actions that they're going to do. I think I was trying to look here. There was some talk kind of about making moves and bettering the roster, just kind of to the point of the free agency stuff we were talking about. But, um, you know, I, it's just, uh, you know, I don't want to keep beating a dead horse on this, but, you know, it just was a very unique article 
that we don't often see, especially on Bengals.com. And it was just kind of a little bit of, of a peek behind the curtain. And it was, you know, someone who is bringing fresh energy into that into that organization. And the fact that they basically every meeting starts with this kind of vision statement that they talk, you know, she, she mentions that in there and just a lot of strategic things. There's also the data side. She says she comes from a background of, of you know, data and, and whatnot. And that's, you know, that's an important factor. I just, it may be something that some deem as, you know, too little, too late, or, you know, it's late to the party or whatever you want to say about it, but it's, it's necessary stuff. And it's stuff that I think is moving the team in a very positive direction. Yeah. And again, is this going to directly correlate to the Bengals getting better? Probably not. Like that still comes with just putting a quality product out there, but it's, it's everything that just kind of comes together in in order to be just a successful organization to, to not cut corners to not pro you know to not just devalue you know the people that are coming into your stadium and and supporting you with this with us undying loyalty and I, I think it also has something to do with the timeline of what the pbs you know stadium deal is and how mm-hmm. it all came together when it when it did come together in the 90s people still harp on how much of a, a crappy deal that was to hamilton county now the, in order for the Bengals to stay in Cincinnati, like they still need to be successful, not you know t- totally, you know, devalue the rest of the fan base and whatnot. But like I think that also has something a little bit to do with it. Like it, it's not too little, too late. As long as the Bengals are in Cincinnati, they need the support of the taxpayers of Hamilton County in order to pay for the stadium because Mike Brown is here. They're not going to do that and, and, and not going to pay for the next stadium deal. So that may have something to do with it. But I, I still think it's 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 a net good more than it is bad and it shouldn't be taken lightly. No, yeah, good point. And uh, we're, we're excited to see what this means going forward. And I think what we talked about with Andre in terms of free agency and what the Bengals will and won't do, that's going to be another big, you know, point to, Hey, you know, the words that were printed a month ago, if we're sitting in mid March, you know, we're, we can look back to these words and say, you know, how committed to winning are you? How committed to spending money are you? And, you know, what moves have you made to better your football team? And if they do similar spending, similar forays in external free agency for the second year in a row, that then starts to point more to a trend and and bucking the old way of things and moving into into a more positive direction to better their football team. It's almost like the butterfly effect. Effect. If you just keep doing things the right way, no matter what you do, it just kind of it's a trickle down effect, and eventually you're going to find success. Yep. Uh, let's drop the mic and get out of here, John. We're going a little long, but it has been an amazing episode. Thank you again for bringing Andre onto the show and arranging that. What do you got for us before we bounce on out? Yeah, it really is that time of year, and again, thanks again to Andre for providing all that useful information and explaining it in a way that I think me and Anthony couldn't really do. So <laughs> to continue on that theme. Um, Jake Lisco actually approached me about a week ago by writing an article about, you know, certain salary cap myths and truths with the Bengals and said, you know, what, let's collab. So Jake Lisco, who's the co-host of Locked on Bengals and a Cincy Jungle alumnus, is going back to CJ just for one time. And he's collaborating on an article with me and we're going to re- be releasing that sometime either a few days after this podcast uh, re- releases or maybe sometime in the next week, maybe like late like the last couple days of february maybe early march just about you know what to expect from the Bengals in terms of a salary cap perspective what their contracts can and have looked like in the past basically going over a lot of stuff that we talked about tonight but to basically clear the air on what to expect going forward in terms of the the whole nfl accounting side of things with the Bengals. sounds awesome and uh i i can't wait to read it i know our listeners can't wait to re- wait to read it and hopefully uh you know, their listeners as well. Well, and I'm sure there's a lot of crossover too, but uh, that's cool. That's awesome. Uh, Jake's a great guy. He, he, he's been on a couple of our listener questions live uh, a couple of mm-hmm. times too. Um, so it's always good to see him. That's awesome. Good, good collaboration there. I think he also did something with Matt Minnick a while ago um, or you, some one of you guys, I think you did a show a little while ago. So that's awesome. We always like to work with other people. I just want to say there are a couple of, uh, couple of people who have helped. Uh, I just got to say a quick couple thank yous. Um, there's a guy, Scott Bantel. He's a co-host on um, a, a podcast I work with, as well as um, Mickey Menser, another co-host on that show. And then Bengal Jim, I talk about him a lot, but those three guys all 
kind of reached out to help me get my my cutouts from the stadium. Uh, the Bengals told me when I when I bought them that they would ship them back, and I guess now they're not doing it. Um, you know, Jim Jim actually called me, and uh, Scott and Mickey offered to help, and it was just very generous. The fact that they were because they're located, you know, in in the Cincinnati area, and the fact that they were able to to you know willing and able to do that was very flattering, and that's. It's very neat of them to to reach out and want to help, and uh, I'll get those one of these days. My hope, John, is that if things are safe and cool and everything, that maybe in springtime for the draft, or uh, you know, maybe closer towards the, uh, the the regular season, maybe we can do some. You know, maybe I can go out to Cincinnati, do some shows in person with you and some other people, and uh, you know, maybe at venues or whatnot, and then. You know, maybe I can finally get my hands on these cutouts, man. They are so elusive. It's so elusive. I can't. I can't get my hands on them. If anyone has, that, that's the other thing. So Scott has them, and then uh, you know he's like, "Yeah, that's like three hundred bucks to ship." I was like, uh, "What?" But, yeah, through like UPS store or FedEx or I don't know something. I'm like, "Okay, well, let me let me think about how to how to handle this one here." Um, uh, yeah, so we're we're trying to trying to figure out some stuff, but anyway, it was very generous of those guys to to want, offer to help me out, and uh, just got to give them a public shout out. Uh, that's going to do it for us this week. Our thanks to Andre Parada. Go follow him on Twitter. John, have a great week, bud. Uh, hopefully, the sun continues to shine in your neck of the woods a little bit more. I know you guys had some cold weather recently, so hope that sunshine stays. Yeah, yeah, like you know anything about the cold. Um, I'll talk to you on Friday. Are we doing listener questions this Friday? Oh, yeah. God, thanks for reminding me. Yes, we <laughs> we will be doing listener questions live Friday. So um, get those into us preemptively if you would like the usual ways or uh, get them to us live as we take the air. So we'll see you Friday afternoon for that. Thanks, John. Have a good week, bud. Have a good week, everybody. We'll see you soon.